Mighty Companions. Let's get this all together. All right, here we go. Welcome to the Way of Mastery. Let's take a breath and welcome to the Way of Mastery. It's time to go deep. Welcome to the Way of Mastery. Take a breath. This is Earl Purdy. Welcome to the Way of Mastery. It's time to join with our mighty companions and go deep, deep into the truth of who we are. It's so good to be with my mighty companions in the way of mastery. And we're gonna talk about very powerful, very powerful subject tonight. We're gonna to talk about the world is innocent. We're going to do the world is innocent in the way of mastery. We're going to talk about the world is innocent. And it's on page 232. It's called The World is Innocent. Part 2 in the way of transformation. In the way of transformation, page 232. In the way of mastery, we're going to do the world is innocent. Page 232, in the way of mastery, in the way of transformation, we're going to do that this evening. I'm Earl Purdy. Welcome to Facebook Live. It's so good that we're going to go deep tonight with each other in this presentation. So I'd like to invite you to take a breath right now. Just take a breath right now and get ready to hear the truth at a brand new level. I want you to just chill out the way that I'm chilling out right now. Because when I get into a meditative place, I like to take it easy, and I'm inviting you to do the same thing. Remember, you don't have to believe the ideas. You don't have to accept the ideas. You don't even have to welcome the ideas. Some of the ideas are going to be hard to believe, some of the ideas are going to be quite startling. You are not asked to judge the ideas at all. It is the use of the ideas. It's going to be the use of the ideas that give the ideas meaning to you and that are going to show you that the ideas are true. Welcome to the way of mastery. Don't forget we have each other. We are live so that we can interact with each other and also interact with me. I see all of the comments. Don't forget to share the video. Take a moment to go down by where you do comments and share the video so that we can have more mighty companions online with us so that we can grow in a powerful way and continue to spread love like never before. Mighty Companions, I appreciate you. I love you too, Diana. I love you, Kim, Morris, everybody that's online right now. We have a very powerful tribe that meets here live, even though you can watch the repost later. We're on page 232, so if anybody comes online, I want to ask you all to let them know where we're located. We're in part two, the way of transformation. We're in the section called the, the World is Innocent. It's lesson 19, 
Surrender the Dream of the Dreamer. Lesson 19, Part 2, The Way of Transformation in the Way of Mastery. The world is innocent. So take a breath as I go through the first paragraph. Remember that our goal is to hear it. Our goal is to hear what it's saying. Beloved friends, I want you to come in your understanding to change what? How you use consciousness. It's time for us to do what? It's time for us to change how we use consciousness. Tell yourself, it's time for me to change how I use my consciousness. It's time for me to change how I use my consciousness. So what do you do? The first thing you do is take pause with us to remember the truth. Pause with us to remember the truth. Catch your breath. Pause with us. Right now, take a pause. Wash off the day. Let the day go. It's time for you to remember the truth. Do you know what the truth is? I'm going to tell you what the truth is. Listen to me. Do you know that the truth is that the world you look out upon, the world that you're looking at, is innocent? Do you know that you may not feel like it's innocent? Do you know that it may not look like it's innocent, but the world is innocent? The world is innocent. The world is innocent. So take a minute, take a pause and tell yourself, the world is innocent. My world is innocent. The world is innocent. We're going to use that to allow ourselves to get centered for a minute. Let's go. The world is innocent. The world is innocent. The world is innocent. Say it to yourself. The world is innocent. 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 Say it to yourself. The world is innocent. The world is innocent. Let's get centered. The world is innocent. 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 Take a breath right now. The world is innocent. 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 Take a breath. Ah. We on page 232, it says, the world that you look upon is innocent. The cause of the world is not found in the world. The cause of the world is not found in the world. The cause of the world is not, what's causing the world is not found in the world. What's causing your world is not found in the world. What's causing the world is not found in the world. 
what's causing the world is not found in the world. What's causing the world is not found in the world. What's causing the world is not found in the world. What's causing the world is but only in the thoughts held within the mind. So what's causing the world, what's causing the world are the thoughts that you're holding in your mind. What's causing the world that you are seeing, do you know that what's causing the world that you're seeing are nothing but the thoughts you're holding in your mind? The, the only thing that's causing the world that you see is the thoughts that you're holding in your mind are the thoughts that you're holding in your mind. So what does that mean? It means that you remain perfectly free. So you are perfectly free to do what? You're perfectly free to choose to perceive differently. So I'm free to choose to see things differently. And you remain free you remain free at all times to see what? Okay, I remain free at all times to see that I'm not the victim of circumstance. So say that to yourself right now. I am not the victim of circumstance. I am not the victim of, a, of circumstance. I am not the victim of circumstance. I'm not the victim of circumstance. You are not the victim. You are not the victim of circumstance. You are not the victim. Do you know that you are not the victim? You are not the victim of circumstance. You are not the victim of circumstance. You are not the victim of a relationship. You are not the victim of a relationship. You are not the victim of a career. You're not the victim of a, of a career. You are not the victim of a career. You are not the victim of a career. You're not the victim of being born in a certain nation. You're not the victim of being born in this nation. You're not the victim. You are never the victim of anything. You are never the victim of anything. You are never the victim of anything. Since nothing within an illusion, and this is an illusion, it's a false idea that we believe is reality, nothing within an illusion holds the power to truly have any effect on you. Nothing within an illusion actually holds the power to truly have an effect on you. So what did that paragraph tell us? Well, the first thing it told us was the one thing that I'm perfectly free to do and the one thing that any person is perfectly free to do is to choose to see things differently. You also remain free all the time to never see yourself as a victim of circumstance. You're free to not see yourself as a victim of a relationship. You're free to not see yourself as a victim of your career. You're free to not see yourself as a victim of being born in the certain in a certain in a certain in a certain na in a certain nation you are not a victim of where you were born you're not a victim of your career you're not a victim of your relationships you're not a victim of circumstance so what I'd like to do because my way of mastery class is an is a class where we participate where we are not just just watching we're also allowing ourselves to change our mind, to perceive differently. So I would like for you to say to yourself, I am not the victim of a relationship. I am not the victim of a relationship. I am not the victim of a relationship. Whether that was the relationship with your parents, the relationship with a lover, spouse, or child, a relationship with a coworker, a relationship with your boss, and you are not the victim of a relationship. So here we go. I am not the victim of a relationship. I am not the victim of a relationship. 
I am not the victim of a relationship. I am not the victim of a relationship. Let's say it. I am not the victim of a relationship. I am not the victim of a relationship. You are not the victim of a relationship. You are not the victim of a relationship. Let's say it. I am not the victim of a relationship. I am not the victim of a relationship. Okay, you got that? Okay, here's the next one. I am not the victim of a career. I am not the victim of a career. I am not the victim of a career. You could say, I am not the victim of my career. I am not the victim of my career. I am not the victim of my job. I am not the victim of my job. Say it. I am not the victim of my job. I am not the victim of my job. I am not the victim of my job. I am not the victim of my work. I am not the victim of my work. You are not the victim of your work. You are not the victim of anything. I am never the victim of anything. Let's say it. I am never the victim of anything. I am never the victim of anything. I am not the victim of anything. I am not the victim of anything. I am not the victim of anything. So repetition gets it into your body, gets it into your mind. Repetition allows you to really let ideas come in. So I love it. That's right, Joanne. What seems so real to the ego mind ain't so. And you're right, Kathy. Music vibrates and reminds you that you're not the victim of a relationship. Kim, you're not the victim of the president, just like you said. Diana says, I'm never the victim of anything. Jesse says, I'm never the victim of anything. Arlene says, I'm not never the victim of anything. Let's jam. That's right. Let's jam. Let's jam. Let's bring some soul into the meeting. Okay, so let's go to the next paragraph. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for interacting with each other and interacting with me. I'm feeling really mellow this evening, and I like it. You know, I look so forward to getting a chance to to join with you all every week. It's a blessing. I cannot put into words how much of a blessing it is to have you all in my life and to share with you and for you to be willing to use me as a messenger for spirit in your life. That's why we're here, to wake up together. Um, the, the music that I use, it comes from a hooked on hooksounds.com. It's just music that you can download. Uh, so I can't get really more specific about it than that. I just go to a website that you're able to get music and use music that's not copyrighted so you don't have to worry about that. So, uh, also, you're the one who remains free to assume responsibility. So it says in the next paragraph, you're the one who remains free to assume responsibility for the domain of your own mind. So what is it that a person is supposed to assume complete responsibility for how they use their mind? You are the one who is free to simply say, you're the one that's free to simply say, Father, Father, Mother, God, Father, Mother, God, Father, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I'm gonna tell you a little secret. The more conscious you become, the more spiritually mature you become, the more you recognize who you really are, the more you turn over what you think you want to God, and more and more you say, not my will, but thy will. I want that which really loves me to be in charge. 
I want that which created me and loves me unconditionally to be in charge. I want that which is brilliant and infinitely intelligent to be in charge. That's what a smart soul says. A smart soul begins to go, Father, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And what will does the Father have? What what is the will of your creator? Uh, that you be happy. So the will of your creator is that you be happy. How do you achieve happiness? The way that you achieve happiness is by returning to the peace that forever passes all understanding. So the, rate, the way that a conscious being becomes happy is by returning first and foremost to peace. A really aware being wants peace more than anything else. They want peace more than anything else. And they know if they return to peace, they want the kind of peace that forever pass all understanding. You want peace that's forever pass all understanding. That's the kind of peace that you want, okay? And the, and the way of, and the way of mastery says that what could your father will for you? Okay, so now it's going to tell us what it is that God wills for us. The way of mastery says God wills for you that you awaken from the dream because uh, higher spiritual teachings continually tell us that what we are experiencing right now is really a dream. And we have to awaken from the dream that there's something in the world. You have to awaken from believing that there's something in the world that can add value to you. You have to awaken from the false idea that there's someone, some career, some location, some what have you that can actually add substance to your being. What, what is it that you think can really add to you? You got to wake up from the dream of thinking that there's something outside of yourself that can add value to you. And better than this, to become free, you got to become free of a perception. What is the perception that you need to become free of? That the lack of someone, the lack of something, the lack of some career, the lack of some location, some form of any kind could distract from your being and from your perfect power of union with God. So, <clears throat> okay, so first thing I, I should do is say, not my will, but God's. And then it says, God's will is that I be happy. Uh, and then God's will is that I be happy by returning to the peace that's so deep and so powerful that it passes all understanding. Uh, the way of master also says, what God, what what is God's will for you is that you wake up from a false idea. God's will for you is that you wake up from the false idea that there's something in the world that can ultimately add to your value. Wake up from the dream, which is the false belief that, that there's some person that can add to your value, that there's some career, some location, uh, something outside of you that's going to add to your value and to the substance of your being. You have to let go of the idea that the lack of someone in your life can really distract from your being. You have to let go of the idea that the lack of some kind of career that you think you want somehow or another devalues you. You have to let go of the perception that that there's any form of anything in this world that can detract from your being, from your perfect power of union with God. That's what God's will is. God's will is that you be happy. And God's will is that you stop fooling yourself into thinking that there is something outside of you, some location, some career, some person, something out there that's going to ultimately be the thing that brings you to the ultimate level of happiness. When you are really spiritually evolving, you begin to open your mind up to the idea that maybe what you think would make you happy isn't really the thing that would make you happy. And you begin to be open to the idea that you're willing to have God's will for perfect happiness for you and that you're willing to have that happiness come to you in the way that God wants that happiness to come to you. And that you are not going to be made happy by thinking that there's something outside of yourself, some person, some career, 
some location or that you can't be happy if you don't have some person or some career or unless you're in some location. Happiness is not in a location. It's ha it is held within your mind and in God's will for you. Now, one of the things that's cool about hearing the truth is that you don't necessarily have to believe it or accept it. But, you know, one of the deepest things was when I began to recognize that, that my beliefs didn't have anything to do with whether or not something is ultimately true. I used to think that something was true only if I believed it was true. And, that, and that's such a that's such an unrealistic perspective when you really hear it. I don't think something is true unless I believe it. I don't think something is true unless I believe it. Unless I believe it, what I'm hearing cannot be true. That nothing could be further from the truth. What you believe and what the truth is, you've had enough experiences in your life to know that what you believe and what the truth is can be two different things. Think about how many times you were absolutely certain that you were right about something and you found out you weren't right about it at all. There's not anybody that has not had that experience. If you will be honest with yourself, you know you've had that experience before where you thought you were absolutely correct about something and you found out later on that you weren't correct about it at all. I wonder how many times you were wrong about something and never knew you were wrong about something. You might be wrong about something right now and don't know it and think you're right about it. So the way of mastery is saying to me, first of all, let me tell you what your creator's will is. Your creator's will is that you be happy, all right? And that you achieve happiness by achieving a level of peace that's beyond your understanding. Then it says, well, the way you're going to get to the, to the, the way you're going to get to the, to the level that you have peace beyond understanding is that you've got to let go of the idea that, uh, that, some, that there's something in the world that's going to add value to you. You have to let go of the idea at some point that there's someone, some career, some location, something out there that you think is going to really add substance to your being. And if you really want to be happy, a person has to let go of the perception that they can't be happy with the, without someone or let go of the idea that you can't be happy without something. You would have to let go of the belief that you can't be happy without some career or some location. In other words, you have to let go of the idea that without somebody, you wouldn't be happy. Um, and understand that the lack of something outside of yourself that you think would make you happy, uh, that does not distract you from your perfect power of your perfect union with God. <clears throat> I love the comments. And like I said, I'm watching your comments and I'm seeing what you are saying. And it's very powerful. It's very powerful. I love you all. So let's go to the next paragraph. The next paragraph says peace then comes. Okay, where does peace come from? Well, the way of mastery says peace then comes from a decision. So first, in order to have peace in a situation, you have to make a decision then you make a decision and then you put that decision into practice and you put that decision into practice over time in which the world is released. So peace comes from a decision that you're going to put into practice that's going to finally release your world and release your world from pain. So what does peace come from? A decision. A Course in Miracles teaches that peace comes from an undivided decision. That when a person is in conflict, it's simply because they have not made up their mind. Whenever a person is in conflict, it just means they have not made up their mind. So peace then comes from a decision, and the decision has to be put in practice. Do you know that the decision has to be put in practice over time? And in the decision that you put into practice over time, that's how the world is released. That's how your world is released to joy. That's how your world is released to happiness, through a decision that you put into practice over time. <clears throat> release from what? What is it that the world is going to be released from? Well, the world is going to be released from your belief that the world should somehow be for you, the conduit, whereby you gain good feelings, love, peace, wisdom, ideas, 
comradeship and even brotherhood or sisterhood. So what is it that what is it that a person needs to be released from? The belief that the that that the world should only be used for making you feel good. You are going to one day on the spiritual path let go of the belief that the purpose of the world is just to serve you and to get you happy and to make you feel good and to give you peace and to give you wisdom and to give you ideas and companionship and brotherhood and sisterhood. Um, you have to let go of the belief that it's only for you to gain good feelings. See, the purpose of the world is not just for me to feel good, not just for me to have peace, not just for me to have wisdom. The world is, is not to be just a conduit to get everybody to serve me. Uh, I have to release myself from that belief. I have to want the world to 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 be used for the, the, the love and for of everyone, the peace of everyone, the wisdom of everyone. A, a, a conscious being never thinks only in terms of I. Uh, the more you wake up to your spiritual identity, the more you get in touch with who you really are spiritually, the less you will use the word I. I, I want this, I want that, I need this, I, 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 I. It's more of a we consciousness. You begin to become more conscious of the we-ness of things. Detachment does not mean avoidance. So when you say you're going to practice detachment, the way of mastery says it does not mean avoidance. But detachment does mean disidentification with a mistaken idea. So if I'm if I'm going to truly be detached, I've got to stop identifying with an idea that is a mistake. So when a person says I'm going to detach, they're saying that I'm going to disidentify with the wrong idea. There's a wrong idea that I'm going to stop identifying with. That is what detachment means according to the way of mastery. It says it right here. Detachment does not mean avoidance, but it does mean disidentification with a mistaken idea. So what causes all suffering? Okay, do you want to hear what causes every suffering? What causes all suffering comes from identification of the deep mind or the soul with the forms that pass as our picturings in this illusion. I'm going to say that until we hear it. Suffering comes from identifying with the physical reality that you are looking at. Suffering comes from identifying with the things you have projected out into your world. Suffering comes from identifying with the physical things that pass in and out of your life, forms that pass as our picturings in this illusion. So the way of master is saying to you and me that the reason why you all are suffering is because you are identifying with the forms that you're looking at, the physical forms that you're looking at. You are identifying with them and it says, this is what causes suffering. The belief that loss is possible. That's what causes suffering. And the belief that gain is possible. That's what causes suffering. There can only be the recognition. There can only be the recognition of what is true. You will only recognize what is true by doing this. What is it that you need to do to recognize what is true? What is it that a person needs to do to recognize what is true? You recognize what is true through making the decision to practice the extending of the good, the holy, which is the innocent, and the beautiful. So how does a person recognize the truth? They say, I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to practice it over time. And the decision that I'm going to practice over time is I'm going to only extend what's good. I'm going to only extend what's holy, which is innocent. 
and I'm only going to extend the beautiful. I'll recognize the truth if I, if I practice extending the good, the holy, and the beautiful. I am going to only extend to you all as best I possibly can. I'm going to only extend to you what's good, what's holy, and what's beautiful. I must also let go of the idea that loss is possible, but also at some level, let go of the idea that gain is possible. Because that's assuming that God hasn't already given me everything. See, if, if, if my creator has already given me everything, then there is not possible for me to gain anything. Because I already have everything, it's not possible to gain anything. So the way of master is said, detachment doesn't come from avoidance. Detachment means I need to stop identifying with a mistaken idea. And the mistaken idea is that there are some forms that I'm looking at in this illusion, this outpicturing that I'm experiencing in this world, me identifying with the physical. Also, the thing that creates uh, a challenge according to the way of mastery is believing that loss is possible. So, so I'm going to say something to you that uh, a part of you may not want to believe, which is it's impossible for you to lose. It is impossible for you to lose. It is impossible. It is not possible for you to lose. It is not possible for you to lose. Loss is impossible. It's impossible for you to lose. It's impossible for you to lose. It is impossible for you to lose. You cannot lose. You cannot lose. Loss is not possible. It is not possible for me to lose. It is not possible for me to lose. It is not possible for me to lose. It is not possible for you to lose. It is not possible for you to lose. It is not possible for me to lose. It is not possible for you to lose. It is not possible for me to lose. It is not possible for us to lose. It is not possible for us to lose. It is not possible for you to lose. It is not possible for us to lose. It is not possible for us to lose. Say it. It is not possible for us to lose. It is not possible for us to lose. It is not possible for me to lose. Say it. It is not possible for me to lose. It is not possible for us to lose. It is not possible for us to lose. It is not possible for you to lose. It is not possible for you to lose. Rhythm, repetition equals remembering. Rhythm, repetition equals remembering. Remembering equals changing your mind and accepting a new belief. So the end of illusion is very near. So how can you tell when you're at the end of illusion? How can you tell when you're practically at the end of your fear? The end of illusion is very near when the mind reaches this following point. The end of illusion is very near when the mind reaches this following point. What is the following point that the mind needs to reach to be at the point that the mind is almost at the end of all illusion, all fear. When any mind looks out upon its creations that it has attempted to make of itself and finds all of its creations lacking, in other words, you believe that something is missing when you look out at your creations, and when that mind that seems like it's looking out on its creations 
and thinks that it's seeing something missing when that mind simply decides to withdraw the value that mind has placed on the world You can tell when you're ready to let go of all your fears. How can you tell when you're ready to let go of all lack? How can you tell when you're ready to let go of all of all lack, all pain, all fear, all sickness? How can you tell? Well, it will be when you look out and when you decide to withdraw the value that you placed on the world and just rest in the simple desire to be with God, with your creator. When you just have only one desire, ultimately, I have the simple desire, I have the simple desire, I have the simple desire to be with God. I have the simple desire to be with love. That's what that means. I have the simple desire to be with truth. Truth, love, God, same thing. So how can you tell when you're ready to stop suffering? How can you tell when you're really ready to let go of all illusion, when you're ready to let go of all fear? The way of mastery says that the way you can do it is just simply to say, I just desire to be with God. I desire to be with love. I desire to be with love. I want love more than I want anything. I want real love more than I want power, money, fame, specialness, and physical pleasure. I want God. I want to be with God. I want to be with my creator. I want to be with that which truly loves me. When a person has just that simple desire to be with God, then heaven is just a step away. And heaven, by the way, is just another term for reality, real love. So, how can you tell when you're ready to let all your fears go? How can you tell when you're truly ready to let go of all anxiety? How can you truly tell when you're ready to let go of, of any pain, any suffering? You will withdraw the value that you're placing on, on the world, and you will simply desire to be with God. You will just simply desire to be with God, and you will want to be with your Creator more than anything else. And then, when you only want God, you're one step away from heaven. You're one step away from reality. And then that last step, that final step, is taken by your Creator for you. So the last step is taken by God. The last step is taken for you. <clears throat> your job is to get to the point that your only desire is to be with love. Your job is to get to the point that you gradually let go of every desire other than the simple desire to be with God. That's what the spiritual path ultimately is. That's the direction it's taking you. It's taking you in the direction of pure ecstasy and pure joy. It's getting you to the point that you don't value anything more than you value your relationship with God. That there is not one relationship of any kind or, or any type in your life that's more important to you than your relationship with love. That's what the spiritual path is doing. It's getting you to the point that you will only value love. You will only value freedom. That you will value your freedom, which is love, which is God, which is truth, above everything and above ev everybody. Anything, anything in the world that you, you, that you let take your peace away, that's your idol. That's the thing that you value more than God. Whatever it is that takes your peace, peace away, that's what you value more than God. That's your idol. So I'll say it again, and, I'm, and if you're following me in the book, you know that all I'm doing is covering what the Way of Master is saying, and it's saying on page 233, 233 it says, the end of illusion is very near when the mind reaches this following point, and what's the following point? When you look out upon your cre creations that you've, tempted, you've attempted to make, and whenever you see anything missing, uh, and then all of a sudden you withdraw all the focus that you're putting on everybody else having to make you happy and everything else and everyone else outside of you having to make you happy, when you let go of the belief that everything and everybody outside of you needs to change in order for you to be happy, 
Whenever you look at what looks like is missing in your life and you simply decide, you know what? Forget all of that. What I really want is God. What I really want is to be with God. Then heaven, which is real love, which is reality, is just a step away. And then the last step is going to be taken by God for you. God's going to do the last step. So this dream of separation has been your responsibility. You're believing that you are separate from everybody else and everybody else is separate from you. That belief, that belief, as the way of master says it, that dream has been your responsibility. Do you know that when you reach that point of collapsing, do you know that that's another way of saying when you reach that point of surrendering, when you reach the point of surrendering, that's when you enter into the stage of restoration, which is salvation. Salvation means restoration. When you say I came for the, when you hear I came for the salvation of the world, it simply means I came for the restoration of the world. And that's in the hands of your creator. Now, thinking that I'm separate from you, that's my responsibility. But the restoration, that's God's responsibility. So my responsibility and your responsibility is just to take responsibility for the fact that you feel separate, to take responsibility for the fact that you feel fear, anger, upset. Your job is to take responsibility for how you are experiencing and seeing your experience. Your part is to take responsibility for how you see things. Take responsibility for your values, your beliefs, and how you see things. Then it says, understand that the restoration though, your healing, your ultimate restoration is in the hands of your creator. That's in the hands of God. Your restoration is in the hands of God. But when that restoration, which means when you get back to recognizing who you really are as love and as a child of God, when restoration has been completed and the mind, so how can you tell when the restoration has been completed? Well, he says, at that point, the mind no longer seeks to journey out into the fields of illusion. So how can I tell when I've been restored? I'm no longer seeking to take myself into illusion, which is fear. And I simply rest empty at one with God. So how can I tell when my restoration has taken place? I'm no longer lost in all the illusions and fears and upsets of the world. And I'm resting empty at one with love. I'm resting empty at one with God. At that point, when I'm resting with God, at that point, when I'm resting with love, at that point, when I've let go of all the illusions and upsets of the world, he says, then, cre then creation can begin anew. So when does creation, true creation, begin? True creation begins when a person is no longer seeking out into the fields of fear, the fields of the world, the fields of projection and blame and not seeing themselves as responsible for their experience. At that point, you can rest empty at one with God and then creation, extension, can begin anew. And so at that point, co-creation is, co is, co is in the hands of you and God. So when is co-creation in the hands of both you and God, when you allow creation to begin anew. How do you allow creation to begin anew? Well, you allow creation to begin anew by resting empty at one with God. What does it mean to rest empty at one with God? It means you are no longer journeying out into fear and projection, and illusion, and anger, and blame, you're no longer not taking responsibility for your experience, of your experience. You're no longer not taking responsibility for how you see things. You don't see yourself anymore as a victim. When you don't see yourself as a victim, and you're not identifying with everything in the world as being you, when a person is resting empty at one with God, then you become a co-creator. 
then you become a co-creator. The only difference is that you are no longer a separate being. See, when you are a co-creator, you're connected with your source. When you're a co-creator, you are joined with God in creation. So the only difference is that you're no longer like a separate being. You're no longer a separate being like a gnat. Like he says, a separate being is like a gnat shouting at the universe. So an ego being, a person who is totally in their ego, someone that's totally in their wrong-mindedness, you can tell when a person is still like the little gnat. The, the way of mastery calls the ego like a gnat. So how can you tell when you're being that little gnat self? Okay, you are being that little gnat self when you are demanding that things be done your way. Stop demanding that things be done your way because if you're demanding that things be done your way, you're like a gnat shouting at the universe, demanding that things be done your way. When you're doing things with God, when you're connected to God, then you're not like a little gnat demanding that things be done your way. When you're actually joined with the creator, you're empty. You're empty. You're empty. You're empty of fear. You're empty of guilt. You're empty of anger. You are empty of the thought that you are alone. You are empty of blaming others. You are empty of the thought that you are a victim. You're empty of the thought that you're just a limited body. When you join with God to co-create with God, you are empty. Now, now, whether you know it or not, you are the paradox of all paradoxes. Whether you know it or not, you are the paradox of all paradoxes. Why? Because you are filled and only Christ, which is your true self, Christ, which is your true loving self abides. Yet not you lives, but only that one. You are now one with love. You are now one with the one self. And so even the arising and the passing away of the body is of no concern for you. When you really wake up to who you really are, when you are really a co-creator with God, because you are empty of all fearful, untrue ego thoughts, then you are the Christ. You are the loving self. You are the one extension of God. And when you are the Christ, when you are the one loving self, one of the ways you can tell is that the body passing away will be of no concern for you. You will stop being concerned about the death of bodies. When you really recognize your eternal nature, when you truly recognize that you are co-creator with God and all that is, when you truly know your spiritual identity, then you will know that you live forever. You will know that everyone else lives forever. You will know that no one ever dies you will know who you are beyond the body. And do you know that when you know who you are beyond the body, you will no longer be concerned about the passing of the body? Take a breath. I know that's intense to hear because right now we may not be at that Christ level of consciousness. Right now, we may not be empty. Right now, you may, there may still be a part of you that sees you as a victim. Because remember, it says, when you have emptied yourself, when your desire to be with God is your only desire, when you allow yourself to be a co-creator with God, then you will only be Christ consciousness. Then you will only be love consciousness. And so the body passing away will have no you will have no concern about that because you know just because the body has died does not mean the person has died. Just because the body dies doesn't mean the person died. Just because the body dies, it doesn't mean that the person who was expressing through that body has died. So therefore, all of the deaths that you think are going on in the world those deaths are just deaths of the body. 
that that there is never a death of the soul. There is, we, we are not bodies. So, when you really are enlightened, Earl, when you really wake up to who you really are, you're just going to get up in the morning and you're going to get up in the morning and you're going to simply say, when you get up in the morning, you're going to simply say, Father, how would you have me be present this day? God, how would you have me be present this day? God, how do you want, you can put it in your own words. You can say, God, how do you want me to be present this day? God, how will you have me be present this day? Creator, how do you want me to be present today? In what way do you want me to be present today? God, in what way? You can put it in your own words. God, how would you have me be present this day? God is love. You could say, love, how would you have me be present this day? God, how would you have me be present this day? How would you have me be present this day? Father, how would you, and, you, and just slow it down. Father, how would you have me be present this day? How would you have me be present this day? Creator, how would you have me be present this day? My creator, how would you have me be present this day? And then there's going to be something else that informs your steps. There will be something else within you that will inform your decision. You will no longer be identified with the fruits of your action. You are no longer concerned with how your actions may look. Uh, when you really give your life over to God, you don't compare your action to somebody else's action. When you wake up and you are co-creator with God, you just you just abide where you are. You just live where you are. You just do what you're doing. And then you offer what you are doing. And you offer what you are doing freely. And the reason why you can offer what you're doing freely is because you're no longer attached to it. So I'll say it again. When you wake up and you're empty and you're no longer focused on projecting others, projecting on others and thinking that your happiness is outside of yourself and on values in the world. At that point, you become empty. You become a co-creator with love. You become a co-creator with God. And you also wake up to your true spiritual identity. When you wake up to your true spiritual identity, what's going on with the body no longer concerns you. The passing away of the body will no longer concern you. You'll just get up every day and you'll simply say, God, how would you have me be present today? God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? God, what do you want me to say? God, who do you want me to say it to? Father, how would you have me be present this day? That's what a conscious loving being does. When they get up in the morning, they ask, Father, how would you have me be present this day? My creator, what do you want me to do today? How would you have me be present today? How would you use me today? And then it says something is going to start informing your steps. Your higher self is going to start informing your decisions. And one of the ways you can tell, one of the, see, I love how the way of mastery continually gets me out of denial because it not only makes statement, statements, it tells me exactly how to tell if I'm thinking correctly. If I'm thinking correctly and I know who I am, it's already told me, well, I'm not, at that point, <clears throat> I'm not projecting on everything outside of me and I'm not expecting anything and everything outside of me to determine my value. I'm not going to stop being happy because somebody changes their mind about me or something leaves my life. I'm not going to feel any kind of lack. Or it told me that when I'm really awakened and I'm really getting in touch with the love that I really am, that I, I won't get upset about the passing away of a body because I'll know that we are all eternal beings. And since we're all eternal beings, then I know that even if the body dies, the person has not died. And most of all, I would be asking God, what do you want me to do today? How do you want me to be present today? Then I would let my higher self make decisions for me. And how can I tell if my higher self is making decisions for me? How can I tell? I can tell because I'm no longer concerned with how my actions look to other people. I'm no longer concerned uh, with what somebody else is doing. So I'm not comparing myself to anyone else. Uh, if I'm really enlightened, if I'm really in touch with who I really am, if I'm really empty, if I'm really doing my creator's will, 
I'll just be where I am, doing what I'm doing, and then whatever I'm doing, I'm going to offer it freely because I'm no longer attached to it. See how it gives us very specific descriptions and instructions about how to tell when we're really changing our mind as opposed to making up when we're really changing our mind. <clears throat> Diana says, uh, I put in an alarm a few weeks ago on my phone that goes off daily that says, why am I not attached to the outcome? Because only God's love can sustain me. And C says, who do you want me to speak to, God? What would you have me do, God? <sighs> Arlene says, God, what is my marching orders for today? That's another great way to put it. Greg says, I love receiving guidance, what to do. It really takes a load off my mind. That's exactly right. I, I do the same thing, brother. I live by guidance. I don't live by what the world, as much as possible. I don't live by what the world tells me that I should do. I follow guidance. Uh, France says, Creator, what would you use? What would you use me today? How would you use me today? What uh, have? What would you have me say today, Creator? Let me hear today. I'm willing to hear you today. That is so good. C says, I don't know what is in my own best interest. Set the intention, not the expectation. And Irene says. I am sustained by the love of God. And I, and I love you all for sharing. And I also want to invite those of you who are silent watching in the shadows, so to speak, to also feel free to share and make comments. Get outside your comfort zone. Do something that you don't normally do. Okay, here we go then. Let's go on further. Um, I know we're at the hour mark, but I don't have anything better to do. This is what... I value, so I'm going to do the 90 minutes this evening. Mm. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> peace. Peace is the essence of the message that we would share with you in this lesson. As a temporary resting period from the work that we have been doing in the way of transformation, peace is what we are going to share with you. Rest assured that there is much more to be done. So there is much more to be done. There is much more to be done. Uh, there is much more to be done. For when the mind is surrendered, when what happens when the mind is surrendered? Resistance dies to the very extension of creation. And when you really have transformed when the mind is surrendered how can you tell when the mind is surrendered how can you tell when you are surrendered you no longer seek to leave any dimension whatsoever see when I'm truly surrendered I'll, I'll, I'll be okay with being here when I'm truly surrendered I'll be perfectly okay with being in this physical dimension because where would I go if, if my mind is surrendered, then I just become one willing to enact whatever is being extended to it from the mind of God. In other words, if I'm truly surrendered, I just want to enact whatever God wants me to do wherever I am. So I'll be okay where I am because I would want God or love to use me wherever I am. In other words, I would want God to use me as a way of being involved with the extension of love. Wherever I am, I want God to use me as a way of being involved with the extension of love. One of the most challenging things that I personally gone through on this spiritual path is to watch how my desire to experience inclusive love and not exclusive love clashes with the belief system in the culture that I grew up in. There's nothing more alien or more frightening to the ego separated mind than the idea of love including everyone and love not being just exclusive to one particular individual the actual practicing of divine love is not the easiest thing to do here but if you're surrendered you go god i want to be involved in the extension of real love i want to be involved in the extension of truth i want to be involved in the extension of innocence the extension of love 
And what does that require? Okay, for you to be used as an extension of love. What does it require for you to be a co-creator with God? How do you become a co-creator with God? How do you become involved with the extension of love? It requires learning how to use your consciousness differently. That requires what? I have to learn how to use my consciousness differently. Tell yourself that. I must learn, I must learn how to use my consciousness differently. It is time for me to learn how to use my consciousness. It is time for me to use consciousness differently. It is time for me to use consciousness differently. So, you're using consciousness differently, but it's all predicated on a return to peace. I'm going to use my consciousness differently so that I can return to peace. I am willing to use my consciousness differently so that I can return to peace. I am willing to use consciousness differently so that I can return to peace. I am willing to use consciousness differently in order to return to peace. I am willing to use consciousness differently in order to return to peace. I am willing to use consciousness differently. Okay, so you're willing to use consciousness differently. You're willing to use consciousness differently in order to return to peace. I am willing to use consciousness differently in order to return to peace. I am willing to use consciousness differently. That's why above all things, did I say above everything? Yes. Above all things, above all things, your responsibility is to enter into surrender. Your, your responsibility above all things is to enter into surrender. That is your responsibility above all things. Your responsibility above all things is to enter into surrender. That means to let the tiny mad idea of a separate self be dissolved. You have to let the tiny mad idea that you are a separate self. You have to allow the tiny mad idea that you are a separate self to be dissolved entirely, entirely from the mind so that there is only the mind of Christ, so that there is only the mind of love. So what is my responsibility? My responsibility is to enter into surrender. What is, is the surrender? I need to let go of the tiny mad idea of just being a separate self. I have to let that idea that I'm just a tiny little separate self. That must be an idea that I allow to be dissolved. Notice it says an idea that I allow to be dissolved entirely from the mind of Christ. I've got to let that go. I've got to let that go. The idea that I'm a separate little being, I have to let that go. So, so what are the questions? What are the questions that we need to ponder? What are the questions that we need to ponder? Well, I want you to pause just for a moment. I want you to pause for a moment, and I want you to look at the place that you are. I want you to look around you and then observe the place that you are right now. Just observe the place that you are right now. In truth, in truth, is there anything around you? Is there anything around you? Is there anything around you in your current in environment that would really add to your substance? Is there anything that you're looking at that would add to your substance? And if you could find a way to possess it, if you could find a way to possess it, if you could find a way to digest it, would it puff you up? If you, if there's something you're looking at, look around your room. Is there anything in the room that would add to your substance? And is there anything in your room that if you possessed it, ingested it, or digested it, that would really, truly puff you up? I mean, it might add a few pounds if it happened to be a bunch of ice cream or a bunch of food in front of you, but that's only to the body. That's only going to affect the body. And I also want you, likewise, as you look around and as you look upon your environment, I want you to, I want you to look upon your environment. Now imagine if the things around you were taken away. Imagine if all the things around you were taken away. If everything around you was taken away, would that actually take anything away from you? If everything in that room was taken away, would it take anything really away from you? 
And so if you can really feel the simple truth of the questions that I'm asking you right now, if you could feel the truth of the questions that I'm asking you right now, then surely you could come to sense that just beneath your environment, just beneath your environment in the world of form, just beneath your environment in the world of the physical, peace is already available. And the reason why peace is already available is because love is waiting on your welcome. Love is waiting on your welcome. Love is waiting on your welcome. God is waiting on you to welcome God. Love Love is waiting on welcome. Love is waiting for you to welcome it. God is waiting on your welcome. Love is waiting on your welcome. So will the world of form, will the physical world seek to pull you into identification with it? Is everything in the physical world, everything we see, we read, we experience, is it trying to pull you into the physical world, the world of form? Uh, yeah, yeah, because that's part of the very outpicturing you created. You you created what you created. You outpictured what you outpictured uh, so that it could pull you into it because it was something that you desired. So will the world of form seek to pull you into identification with it? Yes. Yes. And that's right, see. I'm not the things in my environment. God is waiting for my welcome. So you held the thought in mind. Now, this is what happened. Now, this is what the way of mastery said happened. It said, you held the thought in your mind, would that I could create a world that will pull at me so much that this world will distract me from the one thing I need to do. I held a thought in my mind, would that I create a world that will pull at me so much that it will distract me from the one thing I need to do. And when this world distracts me that I've created from the one thing that I need to do, I can say that I'd be awake right now, except that all of these other things and all these other people need my attention more than God. So uh, the way of mastery is saying, uh, this is what happened. What happened was you created some distractions and the distractions you created, that's the, the excuse that you use for turning your attention to God. Like, like we created all the external distractions in our world. To, there's a part of us that created the external distractions in the world so that I could say I would be happy, I would be awake, except for all these other things and all of these other people that need my attention. If it wasn't for all these other things and all of these other people that need my attention, then I could really focus my attention on God. I could really focus my attention on truth. If it wasn't for all these things and all these issues and all these people that need my attention, then I could focus my attention more on God. If only these people and these things that need my attention if all of these distractions and people and things that needed my attention, if they would go away, then I could know God. So the, so the way of Master is saying, we created the distractions that we're using as an excuse to keep from focusing our attention on the truth and focusing our attention on God. Because we tell ourselves, if I didn't have all this other stuff I needed to take care of, I would study more. If I didn't have all this stuff in the world that's distracted me, I would read more, study more, pray more put more focus on God and put more focus on truth. But the way of master said, no, buddy, what's happened is that you created these distractions so that you could have an excuse to not focus all your attention on God and all your attention on truth. You're innocent, you're cute, but you created your distractions. I remember using my relationships as a distraction by always having to deal with the issues around relationships that were coming up that were keeping me unhappy. Or I would create job distractions or money distractions or health distractions. I had a lot of distractions that I used to. I'm too busy. I got too much to do. Everybody needs me. If I didn't have all these people pulling on me and needing me in so many ways, then I could focus my attention on God more. I could study more. These are just distractions that your ego is making up to keep you from focusing in on God. And so that you can say, if only they would go away, 
uh, then I could know God. If I could just disappear into a cave somewhere, as I, if I was in a cell in a monastery, if, if I could shut out the world, then I could know God. That approach never works. Using a bunch of distractions to keep you from focusing on your spiritual path and your self-realization and your inner work, it ain't going to work. That approach never works. So what is recognition dependent on? What is true recognition dependent on? Well, true recognition is not dependent on any specific state uh, or body. It's not dependent on any particular state of the lower mind. Um, <clears throat> recognition uh, is not dependent on the body or lower mind. It is not necessary to spend endless hours in meditation. It is not necessary to spend endless hours in meditation. It is not necessary to spend. It is not necessary to spend. It is not necessary to spend endless hours in meditation seeking to quiet the mind. It's not necessary to spend hours and hours in meditation seeking to quiet the mind. What is necessary? What is necessary? It's only necessary to withdraw value. Value from what? Withdraw the value from whatever arises in the field of your lower mind. So that quite naturally, what arises, what is recognized, is the perfect value that is held in your prior union with God. You, I have to stop valuing anything other than that, my connection to God, to source. So whatever comes up, whatever naturally arises, I've got to withdraw the value from whatever my ego is trying to distract me with. I have to let go of the value of whatever my fear and anger and guilt is trying to distract me with and recognize the perfect value of my perfect union with God. That's why awakening, that's why salvation, that's why enlightenment. Do you know that enlightenment is not a change? Enlightenment is not a change. To be enlightened is not a change. You don't change when you're enlightened. It has nothing to do with you changing when you're enlightened. When you are enlightened, you just finally recognize what's true. You just recognize what's always been. You just recognize what always will be. You just recognize what is eternal, what never ends. So enlightenment is not a change. You're not going to change. When you become enlightened, you're just going to recognize what the heck is really going on. You're going to recognize the truth. You're going to know the truth. That's what enlightenment is. That's what enlightenment is. It's not a change. It's a recognition. It's a recognition. Okay. So we're going to do a quick review in a minute. And I want to thank you for hanging in there with me the way you have. This evening in the way of mastery, we're going to do a quick recap. I am a full-time teacher. This is my teaching ministry through God. Thank you, God. Um, if you'd like to make, and I would truly appreciate it if you would, if you'd like to make a financial expression of appreciation, please do so. Go to www.earlpurdy.com www.earlpurdy.com. I would truly appreciate a financial expression of appreciation to my teaching ministry. I have hundreds and hundreds of videos of my classes on audio and video on my website, earlpurdy.com, that you can watch freely. So you can get constant reinforces, reinforcement. There are audios and videos on A Course of Love, A Way of Mastery, and uh, The Course of Miracles, and A Way of Mastery, and A Course of Love. These are powerful spiritual teachings that I've done classes on. There are videos, and website, videos on my website covering these classes that you can watch. And also, if you Google me on YouTube, I have over a thousand videos on YouTube that are available to support you and me and what we're doing. I am also a counselor and an advisor and I take over 40 years of metaphysical teaching and learning and counseling, including my knowledge of astrology and numerology. 
and I bring it into the personal session that we have with each other. And it's called a clarity session. I would invite you to go to my website and find out more about my clarity sessions and we can have a clarity session together. We can get past together whatever the blocks are to your happiness or if you have a situation and a circumstance that, or you just want to get a clear understanding of all of this and you want to talk to me personally about it and how to live it and do it. Let's have a clarity session. Go to my website. It explains it. I do three Facebook cl live classes and presentations a week. On Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., I do the Way of Mastery Mountain Time. On Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. Mountain Time, I do hardcore Course in Miracles, especially for Course in Miracles students. And then on Sundays at 1 p.m., I do another Course in Miracles class that's more geared towards the general public and everyone. This, this is my way of allowing myself to be used by God for the extension of love. This is part of my surrender, is that I want to be a conduit for love to come through and to go through. And I really, really, really appreciate you all absolutely coming online and joining with me and sharing my videos. It's a blessing. It's a total and complete blessing. Okay, here we go. The world is innocent. Quick recap. Y'all are awesome. Thank you, Diana, for sharing about my clarity sessions. Let's, let's do a quick review now. Let yourself hear what I have to say. The world is innocent. The world you look at is innocent. Now listen to me. The cause of the world is not found in the world. The cause of the world is not found in the world. The cause of your world is only in the thoughts. The thoughts that are held in your mind. You are perfectly free to choose to see things differently. You are perfectly free to choose. You remain perfectly free to choose to perceive differently. You remain perfectly free to choose to perceive differently. You remain perfectly free to choose to perceive differently, differently. So tell yourself, I am determined to see things differently. I am determined to see things differently. I am determined to see things differently. I am determined to see, say it with me now. I am determined to see things differently. 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 You are 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 determined to see things differently. You want to tell yourself what I'm about to tell you from the way of mastery that you heard tonight. Say, I am am not the victim of circumstance. I am not the victim of circumstance. I am not the victim of circumstance. I am not the victim of a relationship. I am not the victim of a, say it now, I am not the victim of a relationship. Mighty companions, listen to this over and over and over again. One time just doesn't get it. The world is innocent. You are innocent. You are magnificent. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining me live. And please share this. Share this video. Share it. Let's do this together. You are my mighty companions. Thank you for your support. Thank you for everything you are in my life. And I will see you 
next time. Mwah. You all are awesome.